communications we search for mean only that we're looking for some transmission, release of energy, which is clearly a result of technology and therefore the result of intelligent beings of some kind. It exists on only a very narrow band of frequencies. It's generally polarized very strongly in one form or another. And usually it has some modulation, some variation in its signal, which carries the information for which the signal is used. Narrow band with modulation, polarization. Those are our key tests. One of our challenges in SETI is that signals can come in a wide variety of forms. We use a limited uh, form of, of coding our signals, uh, but there are other ways of coding which would make them so that we would not recognize that they were actually signals. They might look like noise to us, and uh, we would not realize that we had actually detected an intelligent signal. This is a problem. Uh, there are ways to solve it. They require extensive computer capability, broad bandwidth reception systems. Or if you're really going to do a good job, you need to watch all the time so that you don't miss any of the transients. And you have to look all over the sky because you don't know which place is most promising. And you have to look at as many frequencies as possible because uh, you can't guess what channel is the favorite of the extraterrestrials. This has always been vexing, particularly to the governmental fund providers. They know that there is a great public interest in detecting extraterrestrial intelligent life. At the same time, they know that we cannot guarantee that we will detect it, or, nor how much will need to be spent to find it. And so it is very hard for them to commit large amounts of funding when they can't guarantee that some benefit will accrue from that. One of the great recent advances in SETI is to look for not only radio signals, but optical signals. Signals from very powerful lasers, which we have now constructed examples of here in our civilization. We have constructed lasers which, when their light power is focused by a large reflector, like a 10-meter telescope as we have, make signals that are easily detectable from distances of thousands of light years. And it could well be that the, one of the ways civilizations communicate with one another is by powerful lasers. And so we should look for them, and we are doing that. In the 57 years that uh, SETI has been pursued, the greatest advance has been in our ability to look at many, many radio frequencies at once. We do have larger telescopes. When I first searched, used a 25-meter telescope. Now we have a 100-meter telescope. That's 16 times larger, so our energy collecting areas are 16 times more. But what is really the big advance is that we've gone from being able to examine one or two or 10 radio channels at once to hundreds of millions today in the Breakthrough Listen project. I am not at all concerned about the possible bad impact of a detection of SETI. I think we will, of course, get something that maybe we can decode and interpret, and maybe we can't. But if we de start decoding it and find out it's something that is, in a way, bad for us, we'll just turn off the receivers and go, go home. I am an optimist about SETI. I believe that the large distance between the stars creates, in a way, a quarantine, making it so that it is actually not reasonable for one civilization to exploit or attack or damage another one. The great cost of doing that is far greater than any benefit that could accrue from it. So I do not feel that we are threatened by the existence of other civilizations and that we can only learn from them and they will not damage us. So to my mind, the name of the game is just to use whatever strategy allows you to look at the most stars at once and never mind which ones they are. Look where most stars are in the beam. And I have a prediction. Are you running? <laughs> the prediction is when we finally find a civilization, it will, its signals will be coming from a star that's not in anybody's catalog. <laughs>